Ernest Holmes papers, November 2016 at Center for Spiritual Living Asheville. I'm so delighted that you came, and we always begin everything with spiritual mind treatment, so take a deep breath. And what I know is that there is a power and a presence in the universe that is all things. It is beyond our wildest imagination. It is greater and more glorious than we can even fathom. And it is what we are right now. And so I know that this evening we open to that greater reality of truth that resides within each one of us. We align with it. We see it. We feel it. We think it. We live it. And we watch our lives completely transform into this higher vibration this higher experience of livingness. And so with great gratitude to know that each one of us gets whatever it is we need tonight. That we take this information, we take this conversation, and we allow it to enrich us. With great gratitude for Ernest Holmes, for the Science of Mind Teaching, for Center for Spiritual Living Asheville, for each and every one of us. I simply release this into the mind of God into all that God is, knowing that God is all, as together we say, and so it is. Yay, come on in. Come on in, Roxanne. So, my goodness, I'm so glad to see you. This is a, um, a new class in that it's a class open to the public instead of a small private class. Uh, and this is the book for the class. You also might run into a book that looks like this. This used to be a three-book group, and now it's been put into one group, one, one book. So we bought 30 books two weeks ago, and they are gone. And what I want to know is how many of you will uh, want a book and will buy it this coming Sunday or next Monday night? Raise your hands high because we're going to count. One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Any more? Because right now, Kate Wagner is ordering twelve copies of the Ernest Holmes papers <laughs> off Amazon Prime, and they should be delivered on Wednesday. Yeah, drop ship them here. So anytime Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or next Monday, you will have your book. If you have Amazon, please feel free to order your book yourself. Um, but these are, we're, we're going to read these and we're going to talk about them, so you really do need the book for this. Just a little bit of history. When, when Center for Spiritual Living Asheville was Center for Creative Living and we were independent, I just made up every class in the world. And so and all of the prac one, practitioner one material uh, I made up and, and taught what I felt was um, um, re relevant to the people and the, the, the consciousness that I wanted to foster in people moving into practitioner class. Was that the book for you when you were in practitioner class? It wasn't. This is what not you, not you, Jane. Rick and Katia, you haven't been... Oh, Jane, you were in practitioner class. Was that the book for you? And I passed it. And I yes, you did. <laughs> 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 you actually worked quite <laughs> So, But that was not the book that we used? No, we did not use the show. Kati and Rick, did you use it for you? Maybe I only used it a couple of years, but I just found the material so deep and so mind-expanding. And to be able to come at it from a, a position of someone <coughs> moving into this idea of wanting to be in service to other people and wanting to be able to affect a healing in that connection with someone, I thought was, was very valuable uh, information in these papers. One of the things that we're going to talk about is the difference between um, manifesting conditions in our life and bringing ourselves into alignment with spirit. 
And one of the things that I have, I have, as Abraham would say, beaten the drum of for years here is to treat in the absolute, not in the relative. To treat at first cause, peace, power, beauty, joy, love, light, wisdom, freedom, uh, happiness, prosperity, wholeness, those kinds of treatments, and then let the let, let the, the details of it come into form, but to bring ourselves into that greater awareness instead of quick treat that this person says that. You know, for me that's, that's really uh, micromanaging and taking this infinite creative power and ability that we have and pounding it into a little tiny box that fits our whim of the moment. You know, there are times when I was looking at uh, uh, relationship breakups that, that I would have, if I could have, had someone treat to make that person stay with me. What a mistake that would have been. Yeah, that would have been just terrible. But with a little bit of time <laughs> under my belt and some hindsight, I could see that that was a greater revealing of truth of the perfection of who Barbara Waterhouse was meant to be in my life. And that holding on to the way that I thought they should be for my security and safety issues, a little Maslow's pyramid of, of needs, was limiting what good I could have. So one of the things that we're going to do is, is it was my intention, one of the things that, that I want us to do is to kind of raise our sights through this <coughs> class to... And, and I know, I, I've already gotten the questions. Well, why do you teach the prosperity class then? If, if you know, we're supposed to just go with this higher level of, of knowingness and we do the increased income program and we do the affirmations and we claim our good, we manifest money right out of thin air and everybody cheers. <laughs> One does not have to eliminate the other. But one of the things that we're going to have is a, a different idea where we can have a big circle of prosperity. <laughs> Maybe freedom, joy, things that people think money's going to give them. And inside of this, can be money. So the concept of prosperity can include money. It's okay to include money, but it's not limited to money. So when we have a diagnosis and someone wants to not have that diagnosis, it's, it's okay to specialize, Ernest calls it, the treatment for that experience. But through it all, I really want people to grow up, and I don't want to make that a put down, to grow up in consciousness into a greater idea of what Ernest would call first cause instead of second cause. To go with the, the uh, unlimited abundance of life and just know that the rent is taken care of. And whatever happens, you know, maybe you win the lottery instead of going finding someone to borrow the money from. Maybe there's a better demonstration in the works than the one that we grab a hold of out of fear. Because when we try to micromanage the universe, we do it out of a sense of fear, don't we? Yes. And so when we're coming from a sense of fear, then we're going to limit that. So, so I just want you to know that, yes, we're still going to treat do the prosperity class. Yes, we're still going to include that the mortgages are paid off and the treatment for freedom on Sunday. Yes, we're going to still have that as an aspect. But this class is going to be about lifting our sights a little higher. The way that you do the impossible is to raise your sights beyond anything that you think is possible. And to do that, the only way I know to do it is to bypass all of the conditions and go straight to God, straight to spirit, straight to the divine, and then allow all of those other details to fall into place. Does that make sense? Yeah. If you're confused, please ask. This is not a beginner's class, 
So if you're confused, it's really okay. Um, raise your hand, ask the questions. There's going to be a, a good amount of discussion because really mysticism is not something that's highly lecturable. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's, it's an opening of us individually. So we're going to have conversation about it and you'll have a chance by next week to, uh, to do some reading. There is no end date to this class. I'm not sure how long it's going to take. There are some things in the, the third and fourth uh, paper of the, the book that we could spend weeks on one phrase. And so I don't want to rush it. I don't want it to get boring. So it's going to be a dance of that. Any other questions? Any questions? Betty. Kind of or no. Just kind of going to see the well, I'm prepared for four papers for tonight. I don't think we'll get through it. So, so kind of every week we'll we'll check in and see where we are and see how far ahead you you want to read. Because <coughs> you're going to open up the book and just start reading. They're short papers. They're surprisingly personal. He rambles. Uh, what is that Myers Briggs that goes, look, a bird? <laughs> He's got that going on. Uh, he's got some little uh, quaint uh, sayings that never came out in his book, like, taint so. It says that a lot, taint so. And his, his books, compared to just the transcripts of his talks, are highly edited. And I have heard that uh, Fenwick was very involved in yeah. the original Science of Mind textbook, getting it written, getting it edited. Uh, and some of Fenwick's students say it's Fenwick's book. But <laughs> Can you remind us who Fenwick is? Fenwick is Ernest's brother. Yes. And Fenwick, Fenwick has a great book out that is my winter project, which is to get it on the um, website in PDF form and to get it recorded. So it's the, uh, the Law of Mind in Healing, something like that, is, is uh, the book I found of Fenwick's. I forgot who gave it to me. Yes, Margo. Are we going to go through the book in order? Or yeah, we're going to do it in order. Okay. It's too complicated not to do it in order. And the first, the first book is The Philosophy of Ernest Holmes, and then we're going to move into the second book, which is The Anatomy of Healing Prayer. And John's going to come in and teach a couple of those classes and teach you spiritual mind treatment. You'll have treatment partners that you'll be pairing up and actually doing spiritual mind treatment work, affirmative prayer for during the week, so that we'll have, have that added dimension of actually acting on the material. And then the last one is uh, words, ideas of power. Yes, ideas of power. But the first, the first book is The Philosophy of Ernest Holmes. And I've, I've managed to get it to 7.15 because we are only going to do this until the break. And if we get done before the break, great. But this is your history lesson. And most people in this center really don't have a big sense of the history of the New Thought Movement and how all of this came about, because I don't like to teach it. So I, I, I would rather teach about ideas of power, you know, and, and all of these great mystical things. And John told me I should rethink that. So, so we're going to talk about um, how, how this thing came about and where we got some of these ideas. Ernest always said there's nothing new here, that all he has done is take some of the best thoughts throughout the ages and put them together and synthesize them into something that people can use in their lives. <coughs> so also, because I'm not a big teacher of the history, if I've forgotten something and you know it, please, by all means, raise your hand and add to the conversation. <laughs> I remember back in the late 60s and early 70s, uh, I think it was uh, Maharishi Mahish Yogi, uh, the Beatles found mm -hmm. the Maharishi. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden this idea of Hinduism and meditation kind of swept the country to the point where my first wedding 
was in the Saraswati Mahashakti Ashram. So a lot of what we got comes from Hinduism. And from Hinduism, we get this idea of oneness. Hinduism is 12,000 years old. The Upanishads, the songs of the Vedas, this uh, idea of, of great celebration and prayer of our oneness. Uh, some of the I think it was a movie I saw where the Tibetan monk wouldn't uh, kill the ant and they were building something and they had to pick up each and every ant and move it because their belief in oneness was so strong that they, they weren't allowed in their belief system to kill anything. And, you know, Rockinger would say, well, that's very prejudicial against the broccoli. Because <laughs> you obviously are willing to kill the rice plant. So from Hinduism, we get this idea of oneness. We get this idea of interconnectedness. We get this idea that, that we are spiritual beings. And the, the uh, Hindu culture is actually set up so that after you live your youth and then you become a householder where you get married and you have children and once you've raised your children you're kind of off the hook for all of that and if you have the means it's not uncommon for people men women stay home for men to go out and to try to find their spiritual path and that that's an actual cycle that's built into the culture of the hindu um, religion. The thing about the, the Hindus is they have a lot of, of uh, different names for different gods, but there's all, all through that this idea that, that all is one, even though there's the many, the many names of, of uh, all I know is Kali and the, the elephant one, whatever, the Baba Ganesh. 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 So the way that that came through over here, with the Hinduism, is that Thomas Troward was an English judge in the Punjab. He lived in India most of his life. And when he came back to Europe, he had all of these ideas that were very Hindu in, in origin. And when he started writing and lecturing in England and in Scotland, the Edinburgh Lectures on Mental Science, that was all coming through the Hindu philosophy. Out of Hinduism came Buddhism. Is there, where's the H? After the U D H. B H D D U. No, B U D D D H I. The thing that came from Buddhism, if you remember, is that um, Siddhartha. Mm -hmm was raised a prince, he was raised in the temples, his father kept him very uh, protected, and he finally broke out, because he was a, you know, a teenager and needed to, to get out. He was very traumatized by the suffering that he saw, and whoever his bodyguard was said, you too are going to die. You too will get sick and die. You know, probably has been waiting all his life to say that to the son. <laughs> Get sick and die. <laughs> that affected Siddhartha so much that he he left his family and he left the the temple and he became an aesthetic, which is someone who just begs and um, he did that for years and he fell into a river and almost died. I think it was a young girl had to fish him out because he was so weak that 
he almost died, and then she had to share with him her meager reserves to feed him and kind of get him back to shape. And he said, well, living in the, the palace didn't work, and living in the, just, just dying on the side of the road didn't work. There must be what he called a middle way. And supposedly the big revelation that he had, his moment of enlightenment under the Bodhi tree, was the idea of cause and effect. But it wasn't just that there is a cause and there is an effect. It was that the cycle of karma, cause and effect, can be stopped at any second. That if you reach a state of enlightenment, of love, whatever it was that, that he called that state, that you can stop the karma. And remember, in, in Hinduism, karma is a big thing. That's why they say that certain castes are untouchables and they deserve it because they were bad in a previous life. Well, it really worked for the society that way. So they, they put a lot of stuff on karma. And the Buddha is saying, no, the, the, the cycle of karma can be stopped and changed at any point. We take a lot out of Christianity. I mean, if you've read Ernest Holmes, the, the, um, the textbook, or the, this book, it's filled with uh, Bible quotes. And Ernest said, don't quote me on quotes. So if he's wrong, it's OK. <laughs> and Christianity comes from uh, Judaism. And the Greeks, with a lot of Hermetic, Hermes Trismegista, a lot of Hermetic philosophy in there came through the Egyptians, because Moses was raised by the Egyptians. He was educated in the in the uh, Pharaoh's. Um, Pyramid, I don't know, whatever it was that he was. <laughs> and so when, when he brought that all into Judaism, it brought a lot of, of the Egyptian philosophy with it. In Judaism, you have one God, which was, was different back then. Remember the idols and don't worship the idols. There's only one God. Moses up on the mountain came down. Everybody's worshiping idols. He got really mad lightning, all of that stuff. So there's one God in Judaism. There's a, a unity in terms of every, like God is in charge of everything. And so there's that, there's that sense of everything is a part of one thing. And they are, they're, their God is a God outside of themselves. It's the God up on the cloud. The, very much a, a dualistic type God. And the, um, the hermetic quote that I pulled out was, as below, as above, so below. That's from, from uh, Hermes. And the Greeks are all about Plato and Plotinus or Plotinus. Um, and frankly, I don't know enough about Greek philosophy to know the difference between the two of those. I think uh, Plotinus was a, uh, a fan of Plato and talked about him a lot. But the Greeks had a god within. The Hebrews had a god without. And the Greeks had a god within. And the uh, Plotinus had this idea that there's a cosmic pattern to everything. And I don't know if that came from Plato or what, but there's a there's a, a, a cosmic pattern, and that's important for us because when we look at something, we look at that, let's say that, that something's happening with you physically, that it's not just about your physical organ, that there's a, there's a spiritual organ that is there. It's not just physical. There is a spiritual truth. There is a spiritual pattern of health and wholeness to all of us. There's a spiritual pattern of peace that is real and that the world of form 
can either be in alignment with that pattern or it can have pulled away. And when it pulls away from that pattern, that's when you get disease and limitation and poverty, all of those things come from pulling away from the spiritual reality, the cosmic pattern. And all of those, this was a long time ago they were talking about all this stuff. So we gathered all of that up. With Christianity, we get the forgiveness of sin and the Father within. And we get a lot more. I'm just, just really condensing it for you. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt, but could you um, just reiterate who was it that believed as above, so below? That was the uh, from from uh, Hermes, Hermes, the Hermetic philosophy. It started with Hermes, Tris, Magista, Magista. Great, 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 great. So here we've got him. Troery. Troery. Here we've got Hinduism, and it branches off to Buddhism. And we've got um, Judaism. Going off into Christianity. And then we've got um, Hermetic going into Judaism because that's what Moses brought. And we've got the Greeks. Who were very deep thinkers, very, very deep thinkers. So out of this, we get oneness, <clears throat> not to be too extreme on any end, and that there's a way to stop karma, which in its time was huge. We've got this idea that says there is a, a benevolent <coughs> deity, there is something that, that loves, whereas uh, the, the, the god of the um, the Jews was a very angry, punitive God. And so we moved into more of a loving, you know, Jesus called God Abba, which was translated into Papa, instead of, oh God, I'm so afraid of you, I cannot look upon you, that kind of thing. So we had a big shift with that, and then we started getting these really great ideas about oneness and about what that means and about the, the Greeks had about this the importance of the individual, the value of the individual. The Hindus had the value of the oneness. You know, the individual didn't have a lot of value, probably because everyone was so poor. They didn't have a lot of value, but the oneness was what had value. So that's the, the long time ago roots that start feeding information and ideas into what eventually was coalesced as science of mind. You have questions about that? <laughs> <laughs> Roberts. The Greeks are looking disconnected up there. Did they not? The, the what? The, the Greeks. Greeks. Did they not pick up something from the Egyptians or? I don't know. Okay. I, I don't know if the Greeks uh, picked something up from the the Egyptians. When was Plato? Wasn't he right after the time of Jesus? No, before. Was he before? Yeah, he was before the Romans. The Romans were at the same time. Okay, so the Greeks were before the Romans, and then the Romans crucified Jesus. So I don't know what they had <laughs> <laughs> they had to the mix. Once the Romans got involved, the, a lot of the disciples left and went to Greece because the Romans couldn't get in there. That's how the Greeks got educated. Was it safe? Good, good. And there, there are all kinds of other people. Uh, too, that Spinoza had a big in influence on, on what is today called New Thought. Roxanne. So, there were a lot of New Thought writers coming out of the end of the 1800s into the 1900s. I'm going to get to the current history. Oh, okay. All right. How, how he, who he taught, who he interacted with. I was curious about that. Right, right. So, what I want, I just want to make sure that you know where we got all of this. These are very, very old ideas. The Upanishads were talking about our oneness 12,000 years ago. 
that you and I are one, that we're all part of one living, breathing something. Drew. You left out the Colbys and the Zoroastrians, but okay. The Zoroastrians, thank you. The thank you. Okay, this is not an exhaustive history lesson. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you do a whole lot more. Yes. <laughs> okay. So the the standard story of how um, how New Thought came to this country starts off in Europe, and I'm not exactly sure how it got started in Europe. I don't think the timing is right for Troward. It might have been brought over with Troward, which was the, no, do you know Katya? Where did, where did Mesmer come from? He was European and came over here. That's where we get the word mesmerized and mm -hmm. so on. Uh, he actually was in America, but where that came from were the salons that were taking place <laughs> in England, where groups of people gathered to learn more about these particular things. Right, and Troward was speaking at those. Yes, but he, his information came from the sutras from India because he was actually a judge in India even though mm -hmm. his family and history was English. Right. So it came from England and he was a part of it, but uh, the majority of it came from Madame B. Blavatsky. 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 Yeah. 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 This <laughs> she was some, the, the, the yeah. theosophist. Yeah. 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 It was really the... the English Empire, which conquered so much of the Far East, and then that opened up all those philosophies to. Well, so the England West. is cooking. Yes, at this England time. Is cooking. England is yeah. cooking, and, and the United States hadn't quite caught fire yet. And there was a guy in England named Antoine Mesmer who came to the United States, and that is where we get the idea of mesmerism, hypnotism. And what he did was he would have, he, he, there's no TV, there's no movies, there's no radio. Somebody comes to town, people turn out. And he was doing something where he was uh, hypnotizing people and they were getting better. And a man saw him, who was very important to our group, called Phineas Parkhurst Quimby. And Quimby, who said, mind is matter in solution, and matter is mind in form. What? <laughs> mind is matter in solution, and matter is mind in form. <coughs> wow. That oh, nice. It's all about the oneness. The oneness. So Quimby saw this guy Mesmer do his stuff, and he was very uh, excited about it. And he said, hey, I can do that. And so he got a young uh, farm boy named Lucius, or Lucas, Lucius, I think it was. And he started hypnotizing Lucius. And so someone would come to Quimby sick, and he would hypnotize this farm boy, this kid. And he was obviously a very psychic and open farm boy. And he would diagnose what was wrong with that person. And in the beginning, he would diagnose some kind of a cure, a tea or something like that. And then he found he could go in and just heal the person, like physically, you know, psychic surgery kind of stuff, only without touching, physically manipulate the organs or whatever in the body. And then Quimby realized he could do it without the farm boy. So the farm boy's out back on the farm. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll never tell you what happens to Lucius. <laughs> So Quimby is healing people like crazy. He has realized that, that there is a, an intelligence that is equal to the physical matter of the body that can be acted upon through the power of thought and, and that people are getting healed like crazy. Yes? May I ask you to spell Quimby? Q-U-I-M-B-Y. Q-U-I-M-B-Y. Quimby. P.P. Quimby. And guess who one of the people were that came to Quimby for healing? Hmm. <laughs> Mary Baker Eddy. <laughs> oh, boy. Enter some of the drama of the <laughs> Mary Baker Eddy came to Quimby and got healed, and it was wonderful. And she went off and started the Christian Science Movement. Interesting, because Quimby was already using that phrase. 
scientific Christianity and Christian science. So Mary ba Baker Eddy went off and started the Christian science movement and later said, no, Quimby didn't heal me and I did this all myself, I made it all up myself. <laughs> Could be why that thing never really took off. So um, of the students of Mary Baker Eddy, those of you in Dr. Grayson's class, is Emma Curtis Hopkins, the teacher of teachers. Emma Curtis Hopkins taught Emily Cady, taught uh, Charles and Myrtle Fillmore, Fillmore. Ernest Holmes was Emma Curtis Hopkins' last student. And from there, we had divine science, Christian science, religious science, um, unity, and unity and religious science have continued on. I don't know what state Christian science is in today, but you're not allowed to read anything but Mary Baker Eddy's readings. And that's why they call them readers, because they stand up on Sunday morning and they read out of the book. I'm not sure how much growth in this day and age you can maintain with that kind of a, of a system. And divine science is, is kind of goes up and down a little bit. It's, I, I think divine science is wonderful. They've got great, uh, great books and great ideas and great people involved. I have a friend that's a, a couple of friends that are divine science ministers. Um, but I think that it's unity and religious science that really have started to, to keep on moving and keep the flow going. Um, then, just as, as Ernest was starting to put all of this together, here he is in Los Angeles, and this is the short version. He's in Los Angeles, he's hanging out with um, scientists and teachers and rabbis and ministers, and <coughs> that was when Einstein came up with E equals MC squared, energy and matter are the same. Yeah, you've got to throw in the speed of light, but that's the blinking in and out of form. Wave particle, wave particle, wave particle, wave particle at the speed of light. And evidently that's the whole that everybody's talking about. Um, Norman Vincent Peale, Power of Positive Thinking, studied Christian science. He was a Christian scientist, there was, he studied that. And then he uh, joined the uh, Church of the Reform and wrote uh, Power of Positive Thinking, and who was his student but Robert Schuller. <coughs> Robert Schuller, who touched millions of people with this positive Christianity, which was new, was very new. <coughs> and maybe you've noticed who's taken Robert Schuller's place now is Joel Osteen. Oh, Joel Osteen's father was friends with Howard Caesar, who was the unity minister in Houston. And so Joel Osteen grew up with this guy Howard Caesar and unity in his life and took a lot of those ideas and incorporated them into his mega whatever it is. <laughs> Uh, and and did, is doing a great job. He's doing just a, a really great job. So, what so the questions. Ben. I was just going to say, what, does he have a particular name for the, for the, his, who he? Joel. Uh-huh. Does he call it divine science? Does he call it? Oh, no, no. He's, he's fundamental Christian. Yeah. 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 He's actually new thought, and then he throws a little bit of Jesus as Savior in the end. <laughs> no, the fundamentals don't like him. No, he's a positive Christianity. I believe that the void that was left by Robert Schuller um, <clears throat> was picked up by Joel Osteen, that there are a lot of people who want a positive message that includes God and Jesus. A lot, I think there are a lot of people in this center who would like a little bit of an outside God and just give me a little Jesus, come on. <laughs> Um, another tie between unity and, and science of mind is uh, Howard Caesar's grooming Michael Gott, who's a science of mind minister, to be the next unity minister at Houston. Random fact. 
Oh, between unity and science of mind. Yeah, because Michael got the science oh, of mind. We're his cousin. Yeah. We're waiting like crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Jen. So in the town that I grew up in, there was a Christian science reading room. Mm -hmm. There's one here. So are you saying that in that Christian science, we always wondered as kids, <laughs> we never saw anybody in there, but um, they had chairs and lots of books. But you're saying that most of those books were all every one of them. All of them. All of them. You are not allowed to read in Fox. Wow. You're not allowed to read anybody other than Mary Baker Eddy. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. Does it have Casey Goodness anywhere? Yeah, I don't know where. <laughs> What was <laughs> the question was, where's Edward Casey and all of this? Yeah, that was fine. I'm looking at What? He's not in that. He's not in New Thought? Not really. Ernest was a big fan of psychic stuff. He's pretty much always Because it's intuitive. Because it's intuitive, yes, yes, yes. So, um, um, your mom had a lot of uh, Blavatsky books. And... A lot of Edgar Casey, and well, she lived. You guys lived in Virginia. Yeah, we went to that place a lot. Did you? Yeah. So there, are, there are a lot of of offshoots. Um, Ernest Holmes loved movie stars. Peggy Lee was his goddaughter, and what we've seen is that a lot of this type of thought has filtered into the film industry, and it's been presented to the public just as a normal course of events. That this is a, a shift in thinking that we've had. And, and I just want to acknowledge that Katya grew up in Ernest Holmes' church. Knew him. Knew all the big greats. Katya. Really? Yes. Yes. So if you've got anything you want to add to all of this. Did they really call him happy? <laughs> yes. That was really his name. Did. His and name he was remarkable. And he was at the Wilshire E. Bell Theater in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. that's where I'm from. And he would have thousands of people in his church. And I began there when I was seven years old. And I'll be 69 next week, so I saw him when I was little. And watched how he spoke to people and who he was. But I just want to share with you about Wait a minute. this particular book. Let me, let me give you this. To share with you about this particular book and about Barbara. <laughs> I heard Ernest Holmes when I, from the time I was 10 to 13 at the Wilshire Ebel Theater and other places, and this is what he talked about, but he didn't have the depth of this book. He only sort of peppered his speech with this information that you're about to receive. And Barbara has, I've looked for years, and I've been all over the world with Science of Mind, and I'm a Science of Mind minister, thanks to Barbara and John, and I, so I've done all my studying and so on, but what's important to know is that each and every one of you are so incredibly fortunate, but I also know you created it, to be here at this time, to listen to what she's going to teach you, because this is the truth of Ernest Holmes. This is what I've looked for, to remember what he taught in those big audiences with all kinds of people from the, uh, uh, the, the industry, is what they called it back then, it's probably still here, but it, it, the, uh, you know, the entertainment industry. But here we are, learning the really deep, soul-searching <coughs> stories that I've hunted for, and Barbara is the only one I have ever known who has had the tenacity and willingness to learn this and now to teach it. God, I'm so thankful. May I live up? <laughs> so just quick facts 
Um, my grandmother, my father's mother, sang in the First Church of Christ Science in Boston for Mary Baker Eddy. And, and that was a long time ago, but yes, the math works out. And that, that my father was raised Christian science, didn't like it at all. As soon as he could, he flipped over into a, a standard um, a Baptist and then Methodist religious paradigm and relied heavily on medical um, doctors <clears throat> until he transitioned because I don't know what it is about kids being raised in a certain kind of a thing and then rebelling against mm -hmm. it. But the first time I ever picked up the Science of Mind textbook, I knew it. I just knew it. I don't know if it's, it's a your past DNA. Life. Yeah, I don't know if it's a past life thing or if it's in my DNA or whatever. <laughs> but this idea that there is a reality that transcends and supersedes anything that we can see or touch or experience made so much sense to me. And other people listen to that and they, they think it's nuts that that you're saying that that this isn't real. You know, it's the only thing that matters to me. And I'm thinking, what a small life you live if that's the only thing that matters to you. So we have this, this movement. And how many of you were in my Annie Ritz Malitz class a couple of winters ago or last winter, whenever it was? <clears throat> and there's a great talk that I did on the, the website called Mothers of New Thought mm -hmm. that talks about all of the women that brought all of these things in. Much of this movement was created by women. Much of this movement was. <laughs> Emma Curtis Hopkins, Emily Cady, uh, Florence Scoble Shin, the, the women that got on trains and traveled places and <coughs> spoke to people and taught people at a time when they didn't have a vote, they could not own property, they did not have any rights to their children. They were bringing this teaching out into the world. And whether it's born on the, the signage of religious science, which is now just pretty much gone, or science of mind, or <laughs> spiritual living, or whatever, whatever it, it's, or Yoda, you know, talk about the mystic, the mystic Yoda, try there is no try. There is no try. There is no try. Do, do, or do, do, or do, or do not. There is no try. Right, right, right. So, however, it has filtered in through the industry, through Los Angeles, through all of these people that, that looked up to Ernest Holmes that were searching for something greater. It's filtered out into a common, common uh, culture now. Anybody who goes into sales. You're going, to, you're going to learn that it's your attitude. When they give you chemotherapy now, they ask you if you believe it's going to help. Because if you don't believe it's going to help you, it's not going to help you. But if you can wrap your head around it to where, yes, I believe that this is going to help, then you go from having a, a 5 or 10% chance to a 95% because your head got wrapped around it, your thought told your body that this was going to help you, and so it did. How many of you are football fans? I see your posts. <laughs> <laughs> they interview the, the winners and the losers after the game, and invariably the losers say, we just weren't on our game. We just couldn't get our heads wrapped around it. We couldn't see it. That kind of a thing. It's so ingrained in our culture that what our focus is, is going to be the experience that we get. And that all started 12,000 years ago with the Upanishads, with the, the, what did you say, the song of what? The sutras. The sutras. If you read a sutra, just a small line, you're going to read Ernest Holmes. You, you, you can get... I always go to Kama Sutra, so... <laughs> 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 so, so that came up through this very smart guy named Thomas Troward, and however else it got back to Europe, Europe was ripe for it, and then it came over to the United States, and people just kept getting, this is the truth, this is the truth, this is the truth. 
who are not evil. There is no sin. There is no black mark against us. We are all connected. We are all created out of love. There's a higher reality going on here to where everything is good, everything is perfect, everything is wonderful, everything is opening and evolving and growing. And there were enough people to hang on to that to allow it to take hold in this country where I believe now it's pervasive. Whether people know it or not, <laughs> this is the way they think. They didn't, they wouldn't have thought that way a hundred years ago. David. Do you know or are you aware if there's a, a sort of parallel movement that started the chart in England before it moved to the United States that, that is still moving in its own direction? I don't. I have a friend that's got a a center that they're starting in um, in England, and and there's just not a big movement there. I don't know why. Does anybody else know? Yeah. Too many pubs. Too cloudy. <laughs> <laughs> well, part of it is well, I don't know. I don't know. I'll tell well, you what's what's exploding. Homes until much later, though. What's exploding is South America. South America, we just got a number of books published in Spanish that are e-books now. They're e-books. They're just fresh off the press, the electronic okay. conceptual <laughs> press, just, just a couple of weeks ago. And in South America, you can't have a, a, a church or a religious group. There's only one church. It is the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. And so the spiritual living circles, which are... Um, if they're not available in Spanish, they're about to be available in Spanish. And the, the books that have just been e-books, because it's hard to get a book book. It's hard enough to get a book here. It's hard to get a book book in the Ukraine, in China. We have a group in um, Tehran. It's hard to get a book there. But an e-book, anybody can get just like that. And as they're translated, you know, Google has a Google Translator now, it'll translate stuff. And, and the more that, that we can make that available, the more it becomes growing worldwide. Jim. Um, could you talk just so briefly about Emily uh, Cady? Um, I don't know anything about her. Emily Cady wrote, what did she write? Kate. Lessons in Truth. Lessons in Truth. She was a big teacher in Unity. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's K A T I E. K A D D Y, I think. No. K A D Y. K A D Y. I'm sorry. C A D Y. C A D Y. Thank you. Thank you. Drew. When I was in insurance, life insurance and health insurance, uh, I was given a book, a uh, um, literate book of selling uh, by Gittimer, who was almost a student of Zig Ziglar. Mm -hmm. And Zig Ziglar, and then science, everything, your thoughts, the way you feel, that will, you're selling your, not only, your, well, not just yourself, you know, you're selling, you're being positive, that positive way of thinking, that's direct science of mind stuff, just, I mean, so, I'm just throwing that out there. Right, and we're, we're, we're moving, uh, probably insurance also, is instead of, I know they're going to sign, I know they're going to buy, I know I make this sale kind of thinking, is if you're just a happy person, you bring to you people who are in alignment with what you're doing, which is selling insurance, and gosh darn, they just buy. And so rather than trying to, to force <coughs> create it, which can be exhausting, and you know you have no idea what you've missed while you were busy making your little package over here, um, then, then you develop a, just a sense of self, a sense of beingness, which then has all of these things unfold. And that's the place that you were talking about, Chicago. That's where I want us to get. I want us to raise our consciousness to the level that our beingness is what manifests instead of Okay, I'm going to hit my goal. Okay, I know that today is going to be the, the day where all of them... Darcy's going, I do that every day. <laughs> the, the, the tough part is being allowed to do that in a structured sales environment because they want you to do things a certain way. And there's a yeah. fine line you have to walk 
to just be yourself and know as opposed to you've got to make this many calls a day, you've got to do it this way, you have to sell that way, don't say this, don't say that. I can't sell like that. I can't sell like that. Well, before you pick up the phone, though, you can just be an absolute love. That's what I do. And, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. and, and that creates in your life. Fear, we've all learned, creates... Uh, it creates amazing things. We are so powerful. We've all mastered creation through fear. And now the idea of creation by seeing the presence of the divine everywhere is, is a different, different way to create. Same creative energy, same power. So just if you just open up your heart and you're just in alignment with whoever you're going to call and you know that, that this is a wonderful experience... And when I do it, words you come out of your mouth are going to be infused with that feeling. When I do it my way, I never miss a goal. When I do it their way, I get constricted and I start cutting off the flow. So right. I just know I have to do it the way that works best for me. Good. Good, good. good as well. <laughs> for, for a brief time, maybe mm -hmm. it was four years ago, I worked on what was called a saves team, trying to save customers that were canceling the product line. And for two of those months, I was the top saves person. And somebody asked me how I did it, and I looked at him and was like, because I don't care. Because <laughs> literally, I would have, they transfer the customer to me. It's like, I want to cancel. It's like, that's fine. My job is to give you two spiels. Let me give my two spiels, and I'll cancel it. And I'd give my two spiels very nonchalantly. And I really didn't care if they canceled or not. Right, but so you're not, the top saves. you're not attached to the outcome. Yeah. When, when Buddha, you know, attachment. When we're attached to the outcome, we've introduced fear into the equation. When we just know that today's a happy day, today's the best day ever, everything's unfolding for our highest and best, and if we can't see it yet, it's just because it's still a half-baked cake. When we move into that kind of a mindset, we have so many, uh, such a, a bigger doorway through which the, the presence of spirit that we are manifests as our lives instead of constricting the flow down. So what we want to do is we want to practice in this class, I call it seeing with God eyes. <coughs> See with your God eyes. Look deeply into every experience until you see the presence of God in it. And when you see that, then it will become to you what you present to it. Ernest got, has a phrase that says, um, God will be to you whatever you per perceive God to be. So however you think God is, that's what God is to you, because God is infinite. And so that presence of the divine will be anything to you. Some people have... You know, <clears throat> language. <laughs> Some people have an idea that uh, every morning when they get up, their concept of deity is, sole purpose is just to hurt them. And that's what they get. Other people have an idea that the entire universe celebrates their joy and comes together in concert and harmony to manifest that in every moment. And that's what they get. So whatever we bring to the equation is what we get out of that. And the question is always not, what is this? But it's, what is this? If I have something going on in my life, what did I bring to that to experience that? And then it just goes deeper and deeper and bigger and bigger and bigger from there. Any other questions before we call it quits on history and take a break? Robert. Yes, on history. Um... The difference between unity and science of I, I heard from a, a unity minister that the difference is, and this is tongue in cheek, uh, that science of mind has really great music, but unity's got Jesus. <laughs> I take the music and yeah. it's really the, the, the presenter. There are some science of mind ministers that 
you couldn't tell them to tell that they weren't in a unity center. Mm -hmm. There are some unity ministers that you couldn't tell were not science of mind ministers, but on balance, unity has a little bit more duality, and they use the Christ or Jesus or something like that to a greater degree than most uh, signs of mind people do. And they don't use treatment. Unity doesn't treat. Right. They do. They do a firm yeah. prayer. Yes. Same. I actually went to a unity one day, and um, I was like, "This doesn't make sense." And now I know why. Because oneness. How can you unify what's already there? Right. Right. But even Ernest said that he called yeah. the second step of treatment unification. Mm -hmm. You know, which you have never heard because I immediately scratched it out. Yeah. <laughs> how can you unify something that is one? And you can't judge a unity church, the, the unity philosophy based on one experience. Mm -hmm. You can't do it. Yeah. <laughs> Kate? The word unification, was that Ernest Holmes? Mm -hmm. I thought that was... No, was no that, was, that was really? Ernest, yeah. Ernest was finding his way. Mm -hmm. That's why these papers are so great because they're they're in like the last they were some of them were after the Epiphany at the Whittier Church and a couple of years before he transitioned. Hazel had already gone and so he, he was hanging out just thinking, you know, really big thoughts. And most of these papers are talks that he gave at his home. Where people would come and they would they would sit with him, kind of reminded me of going up to Burnsville and sitting with Rocking Bear once a week, and just whatever he rambled about was fantastic <laughs> because it's the person, and you get the person through that. But but in the beginning of putting all of this together, there was a lot of, of duality. Ernest says in the textbook, "You cannot be all of God," and then he talks about in order for a unity to be a, a unity that it has to be present in its totality at every point simultaneously. Like, well, you just said two opposite <laughs> things, so he was working it out. And I think that, that the social pressure of the day was, boy, if you say you're, it's bad enough that you're saying you're God. But if you say you're all of God, they're going to lock you up for sure. So, Jen. I'm confused as to unification. Unity you said they're pretty similar to us, except they're more Jesus-focused. But, and they have a little duality. Well, how, how can they be like us if they have a little duality? <laughs> Um, <laughs> you want to take a break? <laughs> there you go. You want to think about this? <laughs> Father, Mother, God, um, help is on the way. Those kinds of things that, that as religious scientists, you would often think that's out of principle, kind of gets a slide with unity. But it's still based on this idea that spirit is all that there is, that we are creating our experience, that there's only love and joy, and that God is inside of all of us, and peace is the reality. Okay. What I have found is that a lot of times unity people will say, signs of mind and unity are the same. And signs of mind people will go, Signs of mind and unity are not the same. Uh, so I love my but unity it's all people. Chris, <laughs> what I found, because I was in unity for six years, okay. uh, actually went to Howard Caesar's church, is that they teach these principles, but they use all of the old Christian terminology. They didn't create new terminology. And so it's these principles with a lot of dualistic terminology is the, the way that I see it. I was at a conference once and a unity group came up to sing and they sang a song called Help is on the Way. And a religious science minister got up right after that and said, no one is coming. <laughs> I don't remember her ever talking about duality, really. I mean, she, I think a lot of it's she could have stepped right into this center and, sure, and been sure. perfectly it's all, at it, home. That, and that's so it's what a I range. said. Everybody it is. It, it's a range. It's a range. Mm -hmm. Susan? So the song we sing every Sunday, Get Ready. When I sing it, I sing, I'm ready. Great. Let's change the word. <laughs> I always hear it that way. When I, I, I just 
since I heard it the first time. When I started in Science of Mind, every Sunday we sang, How Great Thou Art. <laughs> and that was in Science of Mind. So we are a work in progress. We are evolving in consciousness, and the form follows. Let's take a break. So now we get to talk about the fun stuff. I love, oh, oh, Steve, did I see your hand up? Where is Steve? He's outside? He's hiding from me. Steve, I saw your hand up. What were you going to share when class started? <laughs> I was going to share a couple of things, but I'm uh, very slow to raise my hand. I just sit and listen. And when some of the topics came up uh, years ago, I saw an interview with George Lucas sitting at his desk, and on his bookshelf behind him was a copy of The Science of Mind. Uh, on Quimby, in the book Spirits in Rebellion, which tells you the whole history of new thought in the States, uh, he had over 3,000 documented healings. And they speak about a situation where he literally bilocated and was in the Midwest simultaneously as in Boston. Cool. Yeah. And what, what was the other thing? Yeah. <laughs> you were a Jewish minister for a while. Yeah, and, and they're, all, they're all different. They're all different, you know. Uh, <laughs> But their origins uh, included hands-on healing. They had healing rooms where they literally did hands-on healing. And that was a part of it that got dropped and some people were trying to bring back. I love hands-on healing. Yeah. I do. Thank you. Spirits in rebellion. Thank you, Steve. Reverend Steve, yay. yay. I'll leave it for my notes. Um, Ernest Holmes was researching Emerson when he was 12 years old because his father was a Unitarian minister, and Ernest would help his mom get subject material for his father's sermons. And so he was into Emerson from a very, very early age, and he also uh, quit school at 15, something that I can join him in. <laughs> um, um, so that was interesting. Did you know that Ernest was kicked out of Christian science? <laughs> Ernest went to, uh, he lived in Maine, he went to Boston to study speaking, elocutionism. And while he was there, it was run by uh, Christian scientists. And so he started studying this thing called Christian science. And he had the nerve to go and do a public healing treatment on someone, which is against the rules unless you are legal in the Christian science movement to speak the words of healing for someone. So they told him that that was absolutely inappropriate and uh, kicked him out and so he moved back to Los Angeles and started off in the metaphysical library of Los Angeles giving talks on forward. He also did his first healings on kids in the park with warts. <laughs> Um, speaking of getting kicked out, I just learned the other day that Emerson got kicked out of Harvard. Right, he gave a gave us a talk, and they wouldn't let him come back for thirty years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Artist says it took them 30 years to figure out what he said. <laughs> <laughs> Speak, speaking of Emerson, there is one mind common to all men. So there is one mind that is common to all of us. And one of the things that, that we're looking at is I don't use that mind, and you don't use that mind. We don't chop that mind up into little pieces and give a little to you and a little to you and a little to you. It's common to us. It is the essence of us. And this is, this is a hard thing to wrap your head around because we, we are focused in time and space in the world of duplicity. 
and yet we talk about how there's this oneness. <coughs> and yet, it looks like there's manyness, not even two-ness, but there's manyness. And what, what metaphysics asks you to do is to tune into a world where all of these little pieces, it's like, <clears throat> it's like this is oneness, and yet it, it, it includes multiplicity. The multiplicity is included in the oneness. It doesn't take away from the oneness. It doesn't chop up the oneness. The oneness is bigger than the apparent multiplicity. Now, is the multiplicity real? Sure. But is it the highest truth? No. There is a reality that is so far beyond this that is that we are all the same. It's like that, that Mayan phrase that I love so much, in Lakish in Lakim, you are another myself. The indigenous people had this going on for a long time, that we are all the same. I could go to the Game of Thrones with the God of Many Faces. <laughs> <laughs> so it's important that we don't think there is one mind common to all men, that we don't think that I have a piece of it. And, and Ernest did this. You're going to have to give him some slack when you go back to reading his earlier um, writings. When he said that we use mind, that we are parts of the divine. And it's really easy to go into that because that's how it looks. We don't use mind, we are mind. We're not one with God, we are God. And so that's the, the jump that takes it from a really <clears throat> helpful, Kati was talking to me during the break about when The Secret came out and how that information, a very helpful information on what you speak. Clean out your closet, somebody will show up. Clean out your, your carport, a new car will happen. That you can direct your thought, you can use the power of your words, you can manifest things in life. And that was very helpful information for the masses. But we want to go from that to we are that presence of the divine. So we want to take it from a, a useful teaching to a mystical teaching. And when you have a mystical experience, you don't care if there's a car in the driveway. Cars in the driveway show up. You know, maybe Rolls Royces, who knows? But it's not the way that you are looking at the world. You're looking at the world from a higher perspective, a higher viewpoint, a higher vantage point that shifts the way you see yourself because there's only one. You can't see your world different than you see your, yourself. That's why the, the uh, bully on the schoolyard has the worst self-esteem, because they can't see the world different than they see themselves. You can't see your job or your, your body or your bank account or the people in your life a certain way that's not you. You only have you. This is it. This is all you got. You got you. You don't have your, your husband or your wife or your, your car or your house or your money. You don't have any of that. You only have you. And then because we're focused in time and space, that which you are reflects like a prism into all of the people and experiences. But what you bring is what you get. So there is one mind common to all men, all women, all people. And it is you. And Emerson started the whole transcendentalist movement in the United States with these kinds of ideas. Did you have your hand up, Drew? You yes. started to. Yes, yeah, I, I did. Uh, quantum physics also, I love that. It proves many theories. 
it's the the oneness and where where your perspective is like a energy particles entangled particles and everything you have matter antimatter you have things that exist and simultaneously they don't exist at a middle point where they quasi exist mm -hmm. so it's in those states and it's very similar to what's <clears throat> happening here mm -hmm. You've got the oneness. When you look at the broad spectrum, you've got all the oneness. And then you have the single part, particle, or point of the oneness. And then you have the in-between. The And it's all malleable. Right. So if I were to jump into teaching on the teaching symbol right now, we would have the oneness in the top, the, the part where we're all connected, race consciousness, the, the quasi form, and then the individualized point of expression in time and space at the bottom. David and then James. I've read that there's a school of thought in quantum physics too that, that says that if they could quantify the states of energy, matter, whatever that flux that's going on in the universe, that the vast majority of the existence out there, the mass or whatever you want to call it, is in the flux state and not one or the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's always moving. Right, right. Undifferentiated substance. Right. Yes, <clears throat> that's what makes all this stuff. Jane, is it possible to to use what you are for a second in its fullness to do? Well, you're you're using it in that you're bringing that to your day. That's why I want you to start the day happy. Because you bring that happy Jane to your day. But if you start saying, well, I'm going to manipulate this situation because I'm going to use what I am, you, you actually start to shrink it because then you bring your conscious awareness instead of your super conscious awareness, we'll use those words, and you've got a, an end result, you've got an end game that you want to get. <coughs> And, and anytime we are wanting to get, and I know we all do it, I'm not making you wrong for wanting to get, we all want to get, but anytime you want to get, you are actually constricting your creative flow because you are introducing some kind of concern that you might not get what you want to get. Yeah, that you don't already have it. And that you don't already have it. And so once you start interjecting that kind of energy, you're closing down your flow instead of going, this or something better, baby. Um, you know, <laughs> this is a wonderful day. Everything that happens is for my good. I am loving more than I have ever loved before. I'm having a ball at life. And if this doesn't happen the way I thought it was going to happen, it's a surprise. <laughs> so, so when we bring that kind of energy into life, like Becca was saying, not caring, then you're opening up your creative power more. And really, what do you want that to work out for anyway so that you'll have a certain feeling? So that you'll feel safe, so that you'll feel like uh, you're free, so that you'll feel uh, happy, whatever. When you, when you move into that greater level of awareness that says there's the presence of the divine, it's me, it's me in and as everything, everything is in and as me, then I've got those feelings. I've got them right now. And I don't have to wait for something or someone to show up the way that I think it should show up so that I can feel that feeling. We just jump right to it. Yeah. Do you want this on? Didn't I turn it on? I don't see anything happening. Yeah, it's recording. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. <clears throat> so, so you have to kind of keep your, your, um, your uh, need for control out of the system. Oh, the need for control. Where does the need for control come from? Fear. 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 As if we don't have all of the universe in our court. As if we are not the, not the spark of the divine, the blaze of God itself, alive and well as us. As if we are not loved beyond our wildest dreams and we are having the most amazing life and everything is great. No, we have to control that. <laughs> yeah. that's, the, that's the thing that, uh, that I was talking about yesterday when I said that if we could get to the point where we really forgive ourselves, because what is any fear coming from? A lack of forgiveness of ourselves. 
then we would throw out this whole idea of God and the devil and heaven and hell and good and bad and all of that comes from something inside of us feeling like we're not going to be okay, we're not deserving to be loved, we can't have the great life. You know, the, the little flower out in the middle of the parking lot is having a better life than some of us because it's just out there being its flower self. That's no idea it's going to freeze on Wednesday night. <laughs> It's going to transcend. It's going to transcend. Really, really. So the way that we translate that in science of mind now is that we've come up with a thing called um, good and bad translated to this is what I want because this is more spiritual or holy than that. So I'm going to call health good and illness bad. And I'm going to say one is of God and one is not. Yes, this is the look I want to see. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> if there is only one, then everything must be a part of the one. You can't have God is in everything that I like, prosperity, joy, abundance, you know, <laughs> God is in all of these things, I'm going to affirm it, affirm it, affirm it, and then these things, which are restriction and limitation and poverty and illness, those are bad, not God things. They must have a flaw in the consciousness. But when we do that, we cut ourselves off, because we've gone from oneness to two-ness, and it gets subtle. It gets very subtle as to how we choose to live <coughs> our world. We're gonna, you know there are people who won't come to the center if they're sick? They, they won't come, it's like, come in your pajamas. You need to be here if you're sick. People don't want anybody to know that they're uh, living in their car. Had a number of people come into classes that were living in their car but they wouldn't tell anybody till after they had put their life back together again so that they wouldn't be looked down on as experiencing poverty and a lack of consciousness. How is that any different than the traditional judgments of religion? How is that any different? It's not. All of a sudden we've got the good metaphysicians and the bad metaphysicians. <laughs> We've got the good consciousness and the bad consciousness. It's either all God or it isn't. And what did Robert Bitzer used to say? We do not sacrifice principle even on special occasions. <laughs> it's all spirit. And so we start to look at our tendency to judge. Because when we judge, we cut ourselves off from that awareness of the presence of spirit that we are. And if we are judging on the outside, we're judging ourselves. And if we're judging ourselves, we have not done the let us off the hook and let the rest of the world off the hook. The only reason we have wars is because we haven't let everybody off the hook. We're holding on to this judgment that says, you hurt me and I'm going to hurt you back. Not realizing that that original hurt, the mountain will be to me what I am to the mountain that the original hurt came from inside of me. They couldn't hurt me. I had my own hurt that just manifested. And the story I made up about it is, you hurt me, so now I'm going to bomb you. No. When we can stop looking at things as good and bad and right and wrong, take husbands or wives or partners that you are not with right now, ones that have gone by the wayside, <laughs> And perhaps at the time, it was, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? What am I going to do? How am I going to survive? I can't live without this love and approval. And find out it's the best thing that ever happened. <laughs> when we can avoid going through that process, this or something better, baby. You don't want to be with me? Don't let the door hit you in the butt on the way out. Because somebody better is on the way in. Because I know who I am. I wish you well. I'm obviously not your person. If I'd been honest with myself, I could have seen this a year ago. 
that kind of thing. And then you open up to a greater good. You open up to a greater good. If something isn't going the way you want it to go, don't let fear rule you. Don't get angry. I was talking to someone today, and they were angry. I said, don't get angry. They said, well, why shouldn't I get angry? I said, because it's costing you hundreds of dollars. They went, oh, OK. And they just let it go, just like that. <laughs> Give me a reference point. When we can stop looking at things as I'm going to only think that a demonstration of health, and this is why this is practitioner material, a, a, a transition is a healing. You know, oh, I have to manifest a miraculous physical healing for this person. No, you don't. All you do is come into alignment with the idea that everything is wonderful, that there is a cosmic pattern to everything that everybody's in their perfect and right place. Everybody is on their, their perfect and right path. All is well. Typically, that energy will manifest as a physical healing or a demonstration. But it might be that the healing is in transition. It might be that the healing is in the divorce or the bankruptcy or whatever it is that people are afraid of, and then they have it happen and look down the road and go, wow, that put me in the space where I could go and have be do what I really wanted to have be and do. And we don't have to go through that by trying to use this teaching to micromanage every last detail of our life. And then, if it doesn't happen, we blame ourselves that I must not have had the right affirmation, I must not have, not have had the right consciousness to have that, I did something <coughs> wrong. There's something wrong with me. So what we do is we start practicing not judging, even in the subtle things. The subtle things being, well, anybody in their right mind would know that this is good, and that other thing is not good. No. It's all good. It's all good. So when we, I know that, that for me, when I've experienced poverty, it's really put me in a place where I was willing to do the mental work that I needed to do because I was desperate. I was willing to let go of anything. I was willing to follow any instructions, do anything. And because I was willing to do that, my life turned around. But if I hadn't been pushed back against the wall, I wouldn't have done that. I still had something to hold on to. I still had an investment in my life the way that I knew it, you know, with the, um, with the pain of being the caterpillar becomes too, what, what, no, no, that's, it's a flower. When the pain of being the bud becomes too great, then it's willing to open up and be the flower. What is that? That's an Ananias name for it? Mm -hmm. Caterpillars and, and butterflies and buds and flowers. That's, 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 so, so if you can bless that pain and say, there is great value in here, and I'm going to embrace it instead of make myself wrong for it, instead of try to hide who I am, I'm going to embrace that because I know that who I am is so much bigger than this circumstance. I'm the whole of life. What difference does it make where I'm sleeping, what I'm eating, what I'm doing? I am all of God manifest as me, and I'm going to bring that to my life. Not for control and manipulation to have certain circumstances come, just because it's a better way to live. It's a better way to live, to waken in the morning and go, everything is for me. Everybody is me. And so I'm going to love you, and I'm going to love you, and I'm going to love you, and I'm going to see the best in all of you because I see the best in myself. And there's no need for me to be punished. There's no need for an anthropomorphic deity who's just out to hurt me. We don't need to go there. All there is is love. All there is is joy. And so we practice seeing that and living that and being that. And just to have a little bit of reference... Hid within the problem is its own solution. Hid within the apparent evil is the good. Hid within the hell is the heaven. 
Hid within the devil is God. Hid within the disease is its own healing. And in lesson five in the original Science of Mind textbook, which is available on our website in free PDF or free 10 hours worth of audio, Barbara Waterhouse reading it. <laughs> <laughs> In the lesson five, the perfect whole, which if you've got time, I would recommend <coughs> you read this. He says, the unity, the indivisible whole, within which is all of its parts. The whole within which is all of its parts. <coughs> the absolute within which is the relative. The uncreated, within which is the created. The changeless, within which is all change. The formless, within which is all form. The limitless, within which is all space. The timeless, within which is all time. The universal, within which is the individual, the one person within whom are all people, the source and center of all life, power and action, truth, love, mind, spirit, the ever and the all, God. So we live in two different worlds, and yes, we see this, but this is inside <coughs> of a greater reality. Well, what about time and space? Well, time and space is just a little point within the greater reality. The formless holds form. Can you wrap your head around that? It's a highly intuitive concept. But if you get lost in the form, if you get lost in the space, if you get lost in the time, if you get lost in the matter, and think that that's the whole shebang, then you can't get to a greater reality. And the greater reality is where you want to live. I think that's why people get so euphoric upon transition. It's because they get to see the bigger picture. How this is just a little tiny bit of it. Amanda and Drew, you're gonna have to work it out. <laughs> Whichever one you want to go first. Uh, no, uh, it was my arms. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh, Taoism speaks to that, as, as so many in quantum physics and everything, because it's Taoism is the, the general noticing of the interplay of the inner spaces between things, between the matter that holds the matter, and in in many ways they're they're more important at certain, certain instances than matter is because that's the, it, it, scientists have said that the energy within the inner spaces, one cubic centimeter of that energy is greater than all of the known universe that we can see. So the, the, the interspaces between the spokes of the wheel are just as important as the spokes. And considering that that is unformed <coughs> substance, that in there lies infinite possibility. Infinite everything. Remember, if something is infinite, there cannot be anything that is not included in it. Otherwise, it would be the thing, and then that which is not included, it wouldn't be infinite. It would be from oneness to twoness. So in that space above and beyond, what we think we want, our money, our person, our, our body, you know, whatever it is we've uh, put our, our uh, uh, thing to, that we're reflected back as that, then in that greater reality lies all of the possibility. And so when we say that what you're looking for is looking for you, well, how much is looking for you right now? Everything. Everything. And so to open up to that, then, then that's when they say, wow, you're really lucky. This thing just came out of the blue. It didn't come out of the blue. It was always here, and I opened to it. 
And the thing that I've had a lot of trouble with, just to be honest, is the whole non-attachment thing. The whole what? Non-attachment thing. Because I like the power, the personal power, that this teaching gives. I like that. I like to be able to say, I will create that. I will create that. I'm not attached to how long it's going to be. This center will have all of its mortgages paid off because I feel like, although some wonderful people gave us the property, that John and I put this center on the line for a million dollars. And now we're down to a little over half a million. And I want us to clean that up. I don't want to have created that level of indebtedness under the name of Center for Spiritual Living Asheville. I just don't want to do it. I, I feel like I want to clean it up. I want us to pay our bills, pay our debts, do that kind of thing. So this center's mortgages will be paid. It's something that I like. Just because I said it, I know I can do it. <coughs> But there is a greater reality that is bigger than that one desire of mine. It holds that desire, but it's bigger than that desire that says all is well. The universe is abundant. There is more than enough for everyone. There is no debt. There is only clear teaching and consciousness and community and love called Center for Spiritual Living Asheville. That's, <clears throat> that's the higher truth. Now, does one cancel out the other? No. And that's where you get a little schizophrenic. Yeah. <laughs> you have to be highly intuitive and a little schizophrenic to be able to wrap your head around all of this. But then what you get are manifestations without the sweat without the nervousness of it all, without the, oh my God, what if I was wrong and really, there really is a hell and a devil and they're just all out to get me and oh my gosh, what have I done? Instead of that, this or something better, the entire universe loves me. Me. The entire universe loves you. You. To be able to have that feeling of connectedness and support and love and to know that things are in the works, past, present, and future. To demonstrate greater joy in my life because I am opening up to greater joy. To be able to live from that point of view has manifestations show up that we hadn't even thought of yet. But you can't do it to try to get the manifestations to show up because as soon as you do, you've interjected fear. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. This is the world of the mystic. This is the world that will blow your socks off. That would what? That blow your socks <laughs> off. <laughs> that will allow you to have peak experiences. This kind of mindset will allow you to have peak experiences. Experiences of connection, of intimacy of love and joy that you may not even have words to describe them. But being able to pull back your judgment, because some of us have just put a new vocabulary on good and bad, and right and wrong, to be able to pull back our judgment, which only stems from a judgment of self, to open up to the love that, that Ernest keeps quoting that Browning quote about uh, the, the spark ignites the clod, that the human is the clod of dirt and the spark is the spark of the divine. To be able to feel that light, that fire sometimes of the presence of God inside of us, to know that that is all that we are, that we don't carry any baggage from the past, there's nothing to be punished for, there's nothing wrong. There is only God, period. And that that is what we are. To be able to open up to that will heal your body. It will transform your finances. It will transform your relationships. 
It will allow you to be who you have come here to be and to do the work that is yours to do, whatever that may be. It will be a sense of fulfillment, a sense of satisfaction, a sense of clarity that you live your life from. It's about opening up to the bigger you. I don't like to use that word, but I just did. <laughs> <laughs> opening up to that bigger you and to trust enough to know that all of these things work together for your good. And that if you bring that energy into your life, sales will come into form, opportunities will show up, things will happen. And you'll, you'll, you'll just, your life will change into this magical kind of a thing. And that is what I want for us. I want for us all to be prosperous because I don't want us to be afraid. I want us to be able to live the rich life on planet Earth. I want life to be a blessing after blessing after blessing. And to do that, we have to open up to the bigger us that then we bring to our life because our life only reflects back that which we brought it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Sure. Wonderful. Well, I'm wondering if I should go on to the next chapter or if I should just save it for next week. I'll just give you a couple of, uh, of quotes. Talking about spirit, when I see it, it is it seeing me at the level of my seeing it. Say that again. I'll change it to spirit. Okay. When I see spirit, it is spirit seeing me at the level of my seeing spirit. Is that an earnest? Uh huh. When I see spirit, it is spirit seeing me at the level of my seeing spirit. So you can see how you start to spin it. You open it up a little bit bigger. I get a bigger God. And then God becomes to me my experience of that opening. So I get a bigger God. Which means then... Oh my gosh, I got a bigger God. I got a bigger God now. And so God becomes that to me. And so you just open. I mean, you don't have to get all enlightened by next Monday. <laughs> open up a little bit. And watch how it comes back to you. You know, whatever it is you put out, you're going to get back. Get a bigger God. And then watch how you get a bigger God. And then you can get a bigger God. And let yourself off the hook a little bit. Because you're rushing on all of this joy. And you just expand and expand and expand. And it's a wonderful way to live. You know what this does to your body? It just transforms your body. It has money seek you out. Opportunity finds you. Things change because you've changed. But you can't do it to make those things happen. That's the catch. You do it just because that's who you really are. Paul said we see through a glass darkly. Every time we look in the mirror and we think that this is all there is, we have totally missed it. There's a quote in these papers or in the textbook where Ernest says, the only God you will ever see is the God looking back at you from the mirror. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now it's your job to see God in that face. And then if you can see God in that face, you see God everywhere. Some of us find it easier to see it in the other faces than our own. Right, <clears throat> and that's what takes us back. In order for us to really open up, we have to take away all of the reasons that we have closed down. And most of that is guilt and shame. We have to let ourselves off the hook and be willing to really 
be the amazing spiritual being that we are. So practicing it in other people, but then bring it back to you. What else does he say? He says that if you're uh, looking up at anyone, it's just because you've gotten down. So get up off your knees and stand up. <laughs> yeah. We could spend weeks on some of these quotes. Yeah. So I love you. That's what we're going to do on Monday nights. Those of you who give through the auto giving program, thank you. Those of you who give through PayPal, thank you. Those of you who get up and go and use the donation station, thank you. Those of you who have a gift in your hand, thank you. Thank you for so generously supporting the work of this center. We are truly a light in the world. Those of you watching online, go to our donation button on our website, and you too can be part of this. But what I know is that money and finances are always the effect and not the cause. And so we move to that idea of first cause, that all is well. We are abundant beyond our wildest dreams. We are loved for the pure, perfect being that we have always been. And there is always more than enough. And so we give this gift tonight out of that fullness, out of that love, and out of that joy, knowing that it goes to the center to do its good work, to continue awakening the hearts and minds of so many people to who they truly are. I know that Life takes that and returns it to us and that we are constantly in this flow. And that each one of us comes together to make this Center for Spiritual Living Asheville all that it was ever meant to be. It is a place of peace, a beacon of light, a tower of strength, and a fountain of wisdom that touches the lives of all who call it home. And so it is. So it is. <coughs> Breathe it in. Who was it said, there's gold dust in the air. And we deserve to live a life on planet Earth that is filled with beauty, filled with love, and filled with joy. That the very molecules of creation support us in that beauty, and that love, and that joy. I know that all is well in our life. All is well in our lives together, in the life of our center, and on this election eve, in the life of our nation and the life of our world, all is well. I know that everything in these baskets is blessed, that spirit moves through each of us with our giving, and that energy that we are goes right along with our gift. We are beings of golden light filling up this room from the floor to the ceiling and all between the walls. This air is rich and blessed with God as us. I know that that energy goes on out, circles this globe to touch and to bless and to heal every being on this planet, to awaken us all to the amazing spiritual being that we are. Always here and always now, touching every one of us here tonight, everyone who has ever been here, and everyone yet to come. And so it is. Thank you. I love you. Have a wonderful week.